Every breath a trans person takes is an act of revolution. Those are not my words. They are words that I first heard spoken in January 2015 at a Black Lives Matters conference by Lourdes Hunter, a black trans woman from the United States who describes herself as a healer, orator, academic, and educator, a descendant of enslaved Africans, freedom fighters, and liberators, a community organizer and co-founder of the Trans Women of Color Collective, established in 2013 to combat the pervasive and persistent violence experienced by people like herself. I would like to pause for a moment as a white transgender person at this moment in history when transgender issues are bursting into greater visibility to reflect on the uses of transgender history and on the confluence of transgender politics, the politics of race, the politics of alliance, particularly in the contemporary United States, but hopefully in a way that is not merely provincial to North America. It is important to honor the, the racial specificity of the resistance offered by Black Lives Matters movement that took shape in the context of Trayvon Martin's murder by the vigilante George Zimmerman in Florida in 2012, the police murder of Mike Brown in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014, and numerous other high-profile killings of unarmed black citizens in New York, Baltimore, Chicago, Cincinnati, San Francisco, and elsewhere over the last few years. It specifically addresses anti-black structural violence. Co-optations of this slogan, such as the universalist statements, all lives matter, or well-intentioned imitative parallelisms focusing on other oppressed groups, such as brown lives matters, migrant lives matters, or even trans lives matter, all neglect to acknowledge the existence of state and extrajudicial violence that takes aim at blackness in particular, and all fail to acknowledge as well the labor and intentions of the three black women who launched Black Lives Matters. Let me say their names, Patrice Cullors, Opal Tometi, and Alicia Garza. All lives are not allowed to matter in the same ways, and lives that are disallowed are disallowed differently from one another. We are not, in fact, all Berliners, as US President John F. Kennedy said at the height of the Cold War in 1963. We are not all New Yorkers post 9-11. We are not all Khaled Saeed in Egypt. We are not all Charlie Hebdo. At this moment in history, when it feels so vital to generate socio-political critiques that address multiple specific forms of structural violence, how might we best think and act together so that each of us is not alone in our struggles, yet not, not misrepresent the struggles of others as a distorted mirror of our own. I do not believe for one second that the fact that I have experienced social oppression as a white trans woman entitles me to speak on behalf of other oppressed peoples, however much I hope it gives me greater empathy for their circumstances. And so to begin again from where I began a moment ago, every breath a trans person takes is an act of revolution. Why an act of revolution? The only large sample survey of trans people in North America finds that we are four times more likely than the general population to live in extreme poverty, that more than half of us have experienced significant rejection from our families, that nearly half of us are undocumented because we cannot change name and gender markers on state-issued identification documents. We experience more than twice the rates of homelessness, twice the rates of HIV infection, and more than 50% greater rates of incarceration than the population at large. Nearly half of us, 41%, have been so hurt by what the world can do to trans people that we attempt suicide, compared to an attempted suicide rate of less than 4% in the general population. Unsurprisingly, the rates of all such negative consequences of being trans are significantly higher among black and indigenous peoples and somewhat higher among other racially minoritized trans groups who live in the crosshairs of multiple systemic oppressions than they are among trans people who are white. But we should not allow the uneven distribution of these injustices 
to obscure the fact that whatever the color of our skin, class of origin, income level, citizenship status, migration history, birth sex, gender of rearing, or level of educational and professional attainment, simply being perceived and categorized by others as transgender narrows the scope of our life's potential and exposes us to greater risk of premature death. I deliberately echo here Ruth Gilmore's definition of racism as, quote, the state-sanctioned or extra-legal production and exploitation of group-differentiated vulnerability to premature death. In order to highlight both the genealogical connections between, as well as the non-identity of, race and sex classifications within contemporary political regimes. To the extent that transgender people of whatever color are conceived of and treated as biologically differentiated from cisgender people, that is, as a different kind or type of biological being than a non-transgender person, transphobic violence is indeed a racializing violence to the extent that we understand race not narrowly as color or ethnicity, but more broadly as a spurious biologization of culturally salient bodily differences. This is precisely Michel Foucault's concept of racialization as the fundamental biopolitical process, the introduction of a break or rupture into a heterogeneous population that becomes the principle of differentiation between those bodies accorded greater capacity for life and those whose lives are disallowed. It bears mentioning here that the Latin root of the word sex means to divide, while the Latin root of the word gender means kind or type. Thus, when we, when we speak of a sex-gender system, we are talking at root about a system for dividing and classifying bodies and arranging them into social hierarchies, which is to say we are talking about biopolitics, pure and simple. Perhaps because we are so accustomed to conflating race with color, it would be best to call structural violence against trans people of whatever color, as well as structural violence against people of color, whether they are cis or trans, as a kind of speciating violence, a violence that cuts between those deemed to be more human and those deemed to be less. Speciating violences do the work of sorting bodies into hierarchies according to supposedly fixed and immutable physical criteria through what the disability theorist Ellen Samuels calls fantasies of identification that provide evidence of our belief that bodies offer stable grounds for social classification and our desire to stabilize social hierarchies in bodily difference. Every breath that a trans person takes is an act of revolution. Why? Because when the structures of the existing world is such that it more readily steers you towards mortality than vitality, yet you nevertheless love your own life and the life of those you love. When you have quadrupled the poverty rate and 10 times the suicide rate, then every breath you take as a trans person is an act of revolution. Every breath insists on a new ordering of the world. I have been repeating Lords Hunter's words, every breath a trans person takes is an act of revolution, because they inspire me. I want to breathe them in and feel them move me as I share some struggles and am near to others. I want to conspire, to conspire with her words, to breathe with them, alongside them. And in repeating them, chanting them like an incantation. Every breath a trans person takes is an act of revolution. I want you to conspire with them too. At a moment in history when tens of thousands of people recently have marched in the streets of New York City in righteous anger, chanting as their rallying cry the words of an unarmed black man named Eric Garner that he uttered as he lay dying in a police chokehold, I can't breathe. It seems that some of us are indeed finding new ways to breathe together, to conspire in resistance and opposition to state-sanctioned and extrajudicial violence directed at bodies deemed unworthy of life for whatever reason. At such a moment in history, we would do well to recall the words of Franz Fanon in A Dying Colonialism, written in 1959 in reference to the Algerian Revolution, 
quote, there is not occupation of territory on the one hand and independence of persons on the other. It is the country as a whole, its history, its daily pulsations that are contested, disfigured in the hope of a final destruction. Under this condition, the individual's breathing is an observed and an occupied breathing. It is a combat breathing. Fanon's concept of combat breathing increased its critical traction in the US after being promulgated by black feminist playwright and poet Intozake Shange in the 1980s. And it has been embraced more recently by Alexis Gums in her online participatory political art project, The Revolutionary Black Feminist Breathing Chorus. But the concept is not original to Fanon. Combat breathing, or tactical breathing as it is sometimes called, is a technique common to many forms of hand-to-hand -hand martial arts. Proper control of the breath can literally add power to a punch, help reduce injury when receiving a blow, and rejuvenate a fatigued body. The fundamentals of combat breathing are quite simple. To be constantly aware of fatigue level and adjust respiration as needed to keep the lungs as full as possible to exhale forcibly when attacking, and to inhale at every possible opportunity, taking air in rapidly and letting it out slowly. In using the term combat breathing, Fanon and those who have followed him are not merely suggesting that the very breath of the colonized body is under assault. Rather, they are advocating for the instrumentalization of a contested necessity of life as a resistant and defiant act of survival. Fanon's words call our attention to the relationship between territory and population, as well as to the relationship between the techniques through which populations are managed and techniques through which individual bodies are disciplined. Fanon's words served as an epigraph to the first issue of Soma Technics, an academic journal dedicated to transdisciplinary scholarship on the always already technologized nature of embodiment including the material and discursive techniques of embodiment, such as racialization and the production of gendered subjectivities, social technologies that produce the identity categories that reproduce nation, empire, and capital as they circulate through our bodies, harnessing our energies and conscripting our movements. As Suvendrini Pereira and Joseph Pugliese noted in their introduction to that first issue of the journal Soma Technics, the entirety of Fanon's literary corpus brings into sharp focus the indissoluble relationship between technologies of state violence and the enfleshed bodies upon which such technologies operate. Bodies targeted by state violence rendered so expendable that respiration itself becomes a site of struggle. The target subject's energies so fully committed to mere physical survival that it can scarcely resist the powers of the state. Scarcely is the key word here, for the targeted body does indeed engage in combat, does not submit utterly to asymmetrical violence, does with its very breath defy the imperative to cease living, and instead marshals vitality itself as a baseline potential for oppositional and transformational social projects. Is it possible, they ask, to identify points at which state violence fails in its encounter with the recalcitrance of our bodies, bodies that persist in remaining other, excessive, inscrutable, and in flight, regardless of that body's capillary penetration by relations of power hostile to the life it might otherwise live? Yes, it is precisely here, in attending closely to the daily micro-political struggles of living a targeted body's life, in examining the various techniques through which the lives of such bodies are shunted hither or yon towards greater violence or increased reward, it is here in linking such analysis to possibilities for action that bend us towards justice, towards a better life, that we can begin to articulate an emergent trans politics with longer established structural injustices that have targeted other disparaged aspects of bodily being in the world. It is here that we can begin to engage with trans histories and envision trans futurities in the context of different differences that also matter.
I'm fond of paraphrasing a passage in Friedrich Nietzsche's The Uses and Abuses of History for the Present. If the rich and powerful have any use whatsoever for history, he says, it is as a raw material to build a monument to their own greatness. Most people, he continues, have a merely nostalgic relationship to their past. They look there for something that feels comfortable and familiar. Only those who are crushed by a present circumstance, he concludes, and who are determined at all cost to throw off the yoke of their oppression have any need for a critical historiography. My goal as a trans historian is to produce just such a critical historiography. The writing of history too often provides little more than an alibi for currently dominant forms of power, anchoring them in fictions of continuity and inevitability. But the writing of history can, of course, also be part of the struggle against the injustices suffered by a people, providing evidence that things once were not as they are now, offering an account of how current inequities came into being, and promising that the living hand of the present like the dead hand of the past, can indeed be lifted. As long as trans people as a category of people are categorically exposed to greater violence and precarity than comparable groups of non-transgender people, we risk our lives by failing to understand the roots and methods of this subjugation, just as we fail to make that critical knowledge of our history significant if we do not link it to liberatory practices. And just as we fail to make such struggles just, if we do not understand them to be rooted in a deeper struggle that also involves persons different from ourselves. At the risk of being reductive, and however many of the details remain to be filled in, we already know what a standard history of transgender looks like. People who do not conform to emerging gender norms were operated upon, uh, according to medico and medico juridical and psychiatric powers, they were diagnosed and classified, contained, corrected, and sometimes eliminated. Over time, trans people organized against their subjugation through the very terms by which they had been oppressed, transvaluing the stigma attached to their identities into affirmation and marching, in the words of anthropologist Gail Rubin, out of the pages of the diagnostic and statistical manuals and into the pages of social history. A critical history of transgender cannot be limited, however, to simply tracing the emergence of transgender identities across the past few centuries. Rather, it must begin with recognizing transgender capacities for the disruption of established categories of being from within and with identifying the conditions of possibility for such emergent phenomena to appear. Whether in the West or the rest of the world, when what we might call transgender phenomena flare into visibility, they allow us to see in a flash, if perhaps only for an instant, a possible path that life might take moving in a new direction. When the new journal TSQ, Transgender Studies Quarterly, Adopted, as, adopted the phrase, we're changing gender, as its marketing slogan. This is precisely what the editors had in mind. The critical goal is not merely to advocate for greater ease in changing gender in the sense of moving with less friction from one point in the sex gender system to another, but rather to critique how sex gender operates as part of a system of governance, with the goal of changing it in ways that create better odds for survival for thriving, for bodies that live lives disruptive of dominant forms of social organization. A great deal going on in contemporary popular culture suggests that gender is indeed undergoing an intensified period of change. Since the summer of 2014, when Time Magazine announced in a cover story that, quote, America is at a transgender tipping point, whatever that might mean, Transgender issues have attained an unprecedented level of mass media visibility. The rise of Caitlyn Jenner as media spectacle has created an audience of tens of millions attuned to whether the former Olympic athlete will be able to keep up with the Kardashians as a woman. The show Transparent has become the first televised series to win multiple Emmy and Golden Globe awards for a transgender-themed show.
Oscar winner Eddie Redmayne is currently starring in a movie adaptation of David Ebershoff's The Danish Girl, a novelization of the life of Lily Elba, who became one of the first surgically and hormonally transformed transgender people back in the 1930s. It certainly seems that transgender issues have attained an unprecedented level of mass media visibility. But then again, every time I've written that sentence over the past 20 years, it seemed true at that time too. Are we seeing anything truly new? Anything other than the continually unfolding logic of modernity, which perpetually renders transgender phenomena as a spectacular hypervisibility? Are we seeing anything other than macro scale political power, devising new administrative practices for capturing the slippery fish of emergent identities, increasing the speed and efficiency uh, of social administration through flexible strategies of categorization. What, if anything, is actually tipping, and what might we be tipping towards? I'm suspicious of how the concept of a transgender tipping point can be folded into a progress narrative that is anything but the kind of critical history that Nietzsche championed. For many years now, lesbian and gay rights have been held up as a symbol of Western freedom and perversely harnessed through what Jasbir Poir has called homo-nationalism to many racist and colonialist practices of state, such as justifying European resistance to Muslim immigration from the Middle East and North Africa, partially on the grounds that their cultures are homophobic, or Israel's pinkwashing of its occupation of Palestine in part through its promotion of itself as the only beacon of freedom in a region of the world dominated by oppressive and reactionary regimes. As gay and lesbian rights to fully participate in civil society when increasing acceptance, including the rights to marry and serve openly in the military, transgender issues positioned as being more extreme or marginalized than homosexuality now come to be depicted as the next frontier of liberty. It's necessary to resist the historical narrative in which transgender's tipping point means simply that it is now available for co-optation by Western powers eager to trumpet their progressiveness and superiority in relation to the rest of the world, that it has crossed over some sort of chronological divide and can now be instrumentalized for the very state projects that have inflicted such violence on the lives of transgender people themselves. But there is another way to articulate transgender with the idea of a tipping point via the concept of the Anthropocene a new era of planetary history demarcated by the effects of human beings on the Earth that perhaps merit greater sympathy and may hold greater promise. Geologists now point out that if we can imagine an observer of planet Earth millions of years hence, that observer would be able to discover a geological stratum marked by increased level of radiation from nuclear fallout by the presence of plastics and the byproducts of their breakdown in sedimentary formations, by massive amounts of concrete and aluminum, and by a sudden geographical redistribution of species in the fossil record. That will be most of what's left of this planet's surface from the time period when our species existed upon it. Those artifacts attest to how profoundly we humans are currently transforming our world. Given that the climate change we are now experiencing is almost entirely anthropogenic, what better hope for a future that might contain anything descended from us than to address the planetary tipping point we are now experiencing by abandoning what human heretofore has meant and done, or to transform the human into something radically new and see what different and maybe better thing might come. Transgender in this view can perhaps best be conceptualized as a radical will to life in the face of an ever-evolving physical, social, and technical environment that is often hostile to its flourishing. If a critical appraisal of transgender history teaches us that its narrative is largely driven by a will to exclude from life bodies deemed unsuitable for the perpetuation of dominant modes of social organization, if we acknowledge that the human is a socially privileged status fully accorded only to those members of our species capable of occupying those dominant modes of social organization, rather than simply being a name for the species itself, 
if we refuse to deny that the human is the principal mechanism through which we now produce our species death scape, then the very capacities of bodies that lead transgender lives to be outside the human, whether in abjection or in excess, in flight or exile, aligns those lives with the very prospect of a future. They attest to cosmic possibilities for wild and rapturous becomings writ small. When we engage in combat breathing, we fight for something bigger than our own individual life. We survive and resist for something vital yet indiscernible, something monstrous and unfathomable, something yet to come. I'm unwilling to speculate much about the shape of such a future. As Franco Berardi notes in his book, After the Future, the future is not merely a time that has yet to come to pass. The future is an ideology that functions to contain all of our displaced failures to resolve our current crises. Since the 1970s, Berardi claims, after the emergence of neoliberal capitalism and its subsequent hegemonic transnationalization seems to have left us no exit on the macro-political scale, it's become impossible to believe in the future in that way. The punk sensibility in popular culture that proclaims no future heralds precisely this shift towards a refusal of belief in any program for social transformation that pins its hope on that which is yet to come. This is not nihilism so much as, as it is an insistence that our attention should be focused sharply on the here and now, that we should explore our options for carrying on without belief in a particular redemption story, without a conviction that we must somehow succeed, believing only that whatever change can come, comes only from within the current securitization of life, not from some liberatory beyond, that we must move sideways in an experimental and improvisational fashion, rather than forward with a faith in progress, attuned to emergent possibilities, to virtualities that have never yet been materialized, but which might yet be summoned into being. Within such world historical circumstances, when the profit-fueled motivations of environmental degradation and the combined calamities of capitalism, colonialism, and racism, along with all their attendant social pathologies, wreak havoc on such a monumental scale that hopelessness is not irrational, it's easy to withdraw into the personal, to be absorbed and distracted by mass media, to eat comfort food, to seek perhaps only a nostalgic connection to the past. Perhaps this is the only way to preserve oneself in our world today. Perhaps this is the only place to begin moving towards whatever world will come. Perhaps our critical engagement should start precisely here, within the micro-politics of our quotidian bodily being in the world, with our daily practices of eating and sleeping and moving, searching for something viral and scalable that can transmigrate towards others at an order of magnitude that exceeds the individual. Perhaps we should focus on the breath, for each breath mobilizes a baseline vitality filled with potential transformations and holds the promise of a reordered world. Perhaps at this moment in history, we have nowhere better to focus. Felix Guattari characterized such micro-political transformations as molecular revolutions, which he believed complemented rather than opposed traditional notions of social revolution. Change does not have to come about from large-scale socioeconomic conditions, he wrote in the mid-1970s essay, I Am an Idea Thief. Molecular mutations do not always assert themselves on a large scale, and they must be gauged differently in the short term. But this does not mean they do not exist. We do not have the same relations to reading, writing, images, space, sex, the body, the night, the sun, pain, as we had only 10 years ago. Profound and irreversible mutations are already underway in all these areas. In other words, the molecular substratum on which all large social collectivities are inscribed has become a sort of bubbling soup. Like a lot of other middle-class white people in North America, I've practiced a westernized, hybridized version of yoga-like stretching and meditation exercises for many years, 
and have, as an adult, learned some Sanskrit words for things my body already taught me long ago. For example, we tend to think of breathing as a two-part process. We inhale, we exhale. But breathing is really fourfold. Inhalation, pause, exhalation, pause. It takes a beat of time for the bellows of the lungs to reverse direction. The rhythm of the gathering and the letting go of breath thus includes the space between the breath. That space between, so unmindfully hurried through, can be expanded and amplified through conscious attention and active practice. In Sanskrit, pranayama, the extension or drawing out of the life force through conscious attention to the breath. Kumbhaka pranayama, attention to the breath through the practice of retaining or holding one's breath. Antar kumbhaka, the cessation of breath once inhalation is complete. Baya kumbhaka, the cessation of breath once exhalation is complete. The voluntary cessation of breathing is perhaps the most important physical technique for calming the chattering mind in order to consciously experience meditative absorption, samadhi. It is the opposite of combat breathing, the other side of the coin. As an adolescent, I swam. Starting around age 10, when we moved to a new town and both my parents worked full-time jobs, the swimming pool at the YMCA became my babysitter each summer, all summer long. I was dropped off in the morning, picked up in the late afternoon. By 13, when my father died, the water had become an important refuge, albeit one that I could attain only after having passed through the locker room. That sex-segregated space of total nakedness was a psychologically brutal gauntlet for a young, pre-transitional, transgender-identified person to pass through, and the public semi-nakedness of the swimsuit hardly less excruciating. But I accepted both conditions as the price to be paid for accessing a space that I needed in another way. I reveled in the freedom of three-dimensional underwater movement a freedom possible for precisely as long as I could hold my breath. I practiced, training myself to extend the duration of breath retention to maximize the time I could spend in the spaces between. I could detach from and in solitude observe there my father's absence, my mother's distress, and my own dysphoric relation to embodiment, the suffocating pervasiveness of social gendering and instead take a fundamental pleasure and a greater capacity for movement, moving in a way impossible to move on the terrestrial plane. Play space, tumbling in dream time, philosophizing and world building, refiguring myself as I moved. I could contemplatively experience the fact that the liquid environment that enabled such joy was simultaneously unlivable for any great length of time while the gaseous environment I returned to to sustain my life in the physical dimension threatened social and psychical death for my own most vital sense of self. As a child, I cultivated an amphibious disposition, moving ceaselessly between things that killed me and enlivened me in different ways, at different rates and different speeds. Amphibian, in its roots, ambi plus bios, means to have two kinds of life. I meditate now on this amphibian nature, aquatically mammalian, off-center from the human, while lying in meditation, shavasana, the death pose. At my university job, I intellectualize the necessary discoveries of my childhood as a meta-methodological transgender art of living. Most of what is, is nothing the feminist physicist Karen Barad reminds us. Atoms, like galaxies, are mostly empty space, a void teeming with quantum virtualities playing out their possibilities in the darkness of unbeing, such that mattering is but an infinite exploration of infinite potential becomings. What comes to matter literally emerges from the void, from the interstices, from the spaces between.
In a similar vein, more prosaic but no less cosmic in its implications, Martin Heidegger writes in his 1962 essay, The Thing, about an ordinary jug in order to address the question of being's emergence from the void. It is not the sides or the bottom of the jug that accomplishes the act of holding or containing Heidegger contended, but rather the empty space. It is the void, the no thing, alongside the jug's thinginess that holds. Heidegger notes further that it is only in the act of spilling forth that that which has been held, uh, that the jug's action of holding finds completion. This outpouring from the void takes the form of a gift, a gift that gathers what belongs to the giving. For Heidegger, the outpoured gift gathers what he suggestively calls, given the four-part biomechanics of human breathing I just mentioned, he calls the fourfold, by which he means a double union of earth and sky, divinities and mortals. The overtly theological framework of his formulation notwithstanding, Heidegger's vision of a gushing void of a capacious outpouring from nothingness of a something that is the materialization of many gathered potentials solicits me. It speaks to my sense of all life as a fundamental process of grasping virtual possibilities imminent in the organization of the material world, but as yet unrealized within it, which being is capable of bringing forth. It is within our capacities as living entities to recognize that which is not yet, but which yet might actually be, and to bring it into being through our actions, both personal and collective. Every breath that a trans person takes is an act of revolution, and each fourfold breath contains the space between. Of necessity, we breathe to live and live to dream. We detach from our struggles, we engage in combat for lives worth living to persist. Thank you.